Hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. I'm Justin. Fire. The harnessing of it sparked human civilization. Despite all the good kinds of fire, such as the fire of learning, it can also be quite a destructive force which has wreaked havoc on civilizations throughout history. History is plagued with lists of great fires. Modern firefighting began in the 18th and 19th century alongside the Industrial Revolution with the invention of certain technology, such as pumps similar to the ones we use today. The question of today's video is, how did past civilizations, specifically Rome, handle fires? Did they have firefighting brigades or organizations that resemble our own, or did they just lie down and accept it as the will of the gods? Let's get to it. Before we begin, I would like to thank Stephen Page, Travis Williams, Joseph Donahue, Berserkerhead, Bogdan Goda, Aaron Heffington, Cesar Garcia, Joseph Thompson, Mark Smith, and Tenzine Thinley for being our most recent supporters on Patreon. They join these supporters who make these videos possible. There's a very interesting story to the beginning of the Roman Firefighting Brigade. It began with Marcus Licinius Crassus, who was born around 115 BC. This is THE Crassus, member of the First Triumvirate along with Pompey and Julius Caesar, the man who led the army against the Persians at the disastrous Battle of Carhai, and the man who nearly stood up to the vicious chicken of Bristol. Actually, that last one isn't quite true, but anyway. Coming from a wealthy family to begin with, he also became the richest man in Rome at the time. One of the ways through which he acquired this wealth, actually, was through firefighting. Fires in cities at this time were not uncommon. Nighttime lighting and warmth was dependent on fire, and many buildings were partially or fully made of wood. Since the city of Rome did not have a professional firefighting force at this time, he created its first brigade, consisting of around a half thousand men. According to Plutarch, when a fire erupted, Crassus and his firefighters would be on the scene as quickly as possible. However, they would not act immediately. Generally, Crassus would attempt to buy the property at a ridiculously low price. If the owner refused, he would probably cite one of the Ferengi rules of acquisition and do nothing. Through this method, Crassus became Rome's biggest property owner of the time. Because he also specifically purchased slaves who had a background in construction or architecture, the property he would purchase was back in shape not too long after, and ready to be leased to the original owners. Crassus died at Carhai in 53 BC. However, his firefighting idea had caught on. Thirty years later, after Rome had transitioned from Republic into Empire, Emperor Augustus began organizing the city's first public fire department. Similar firefighting forces had existed in the Hellenic world, such as in the city of Alexandria, decades before this, however, and it was after them that he modeled this force. After the Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD, the force was expanded by the Emperor Nero. Some claimed that Nero had allowed the fire to ravage the city intentionally, so that he could build a palace on the area it cleared, though it's uncertain whether or not this was indeed his intention. The force was bolstered following the fire regardless. The force was to be known as the Watchmen, or Vigilace, or Wigilace more correctly, derived from the common ancestor to our word, Vigil, but they were also nicknamed the Spartoli, or Bucket Boys. This force in the city of Rome consisted of around 7,000 Wigilace, who also doubled as policemen, in a sense. While watching the city at night for fires, they would also keep a lookout for criminals and runaway slaves, and also even dispel mobs. They primarily handled petty crimes, but were very occasionally used as riot control. Furthermore, there were four doctors, or medici, attached to each cohort of watchmen. The head position of the force, the prefect, was appointed by the emperor. There were seven cohorts, each responsible for two regions of the city, which were each subdivided into seven centuries, consisting of between 50 to 100 men. It was a bit like the military, and in fact, the common firefighter was sometimes known as a miles, or soldier. But much like modern day emergency services, they were not considered part of the military. Commanders of the force did come from the military, however, and in extreme situations, they did take on the role of the military. There were multiple fire stations, or excubatoriums, or rather excubatori, strategically placed around the city where they and their equipment were ready to go. They signed up for a minimum of six years and were granted Roman citizenship 
for this service, though this was eventually shortened to three. This organized force stuck around throughout much of the Empire's existence, and was modeled in other cities like Carthage, Ravenna, and Constantinople. It was even around in the Byzantine Empire, during the reign of Justinian. But how did it work? How efficient was it? Most firefighting in the Roman Empire, and really across much of Europe before and after the Empire's collapse until the early modern era of course, was done very simply, with bucket brigades. This is a long line of people who moved buckets from a water source to the fire, in early Rome generally consisting of slaves and or volunteers. This process was facilitated as homes were required to keep firefighting equipment ready. People in Rome and Byzantium who didn't comply with this rule were sometimes punished by beating. Great cities like Rome itself, however, had not only more advanced organization, but also more advanced technology available. A primitive fire hose had been invented by the ancient Greek inventor Tisibius. It was mounted on a carriage pulled by horses, partially submerged in water and operated by a handful of siphonari. It would suck water in from the source and spray a jet of it as far as 20 to 30 meters in the air. A substance derived from vinegar called acetum, or in Latin, acidum, was also thrown into the fire. When this failed, however, it was often necessary to tear buildings down to smother the fire and prevent its spread. Preventing the spread was key. Long hooks, picks, axes, and even ballistae were used for this purpose. Your house is on fire, so they fire a ballista at it. Can you imagine? Anyway. When putting out fires in multiple story buildings, cushions were often laid out on the surrounding ground so that people could jump out from the windows onto them. For its day, it was quite advanced. As Roman history attests though, this force was not able to stop every major fire from erupting, but it no doubt prevented a number of major ones. After the empire fell, as I said, this force naturally disappeared sometime around the 4th century, and Europe would not see such firefighting efficiency again until the early modern era. Still, their memory lives on. The firefighting and emergency services of modern Italy are known as the Vigili del Fuoco. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. Remember, the Fire of Learning is the one which you want to spread. To help with the cost of production, a donation on Patreon would be a big help. A special thanks to those patrons listed here. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, so come check us out there too. Gratias Tibiago for watching.